Stephen Unity asked me to sort of talk about uh, the future of health and medicine, and I thought I would sort of tie it together with, you know, the incredible moonshot initiatives that many folks in the community here are doing. It's really going to make the uh, uh, make the impossible possible. Uh, and realizing that today we're already, here we are in 2020, we've kind of arrived in the future. Many technologies have accelerated, they've shifted our world, they've disrupted many business models from how we, you know, do our banking to our, get our um, entertainment. You know, but healthcare in reality is still stuck in the third industrial age where we're still using fax machines and pill cutters and many folks don't have access to primary care, let alone specialists. And so it's our opportunity to take many of the technologies that are already here that have started to converge, everything from AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, genomics, and beyond, to, to leverage those to take us to our own moon uh, shots and beyond, to the, to the universe and, and constellations beyond the moon. And so I would challenge you to think of how do we take some of these conversion technologies and now create entirely new fields? I mean, a decade ago, we didn't really have digiceuticals or VR-based therapy or AI and drug discovery really an interesting time where we can all start to rethink and reimagine the future of healthcare and really address in meaningful ways these moonshots in a shorter time frame than we might think possible. So I'm going to try and connect some of these dots here about what's already here and what might be, might be coming. You know, Here in San Francisco or Calcutta, we're still waiting in waiting rooms. We're still practicing healthcare in silos based on departments or body parts, but we're in this you know, exponential uh, connected digital age, we can reimagine and shift from our episodic and reactive sick care model to one of continuous and proactive uh, health care and, and start to democratize that around the planet. And so the future of medicine is a bit in the zeitgeist. This is actually the cover of uh, last year's National Geographic. I had the honor of writing the, one of the cover stories for this. And, you know, a lot of people think about medicine, technologies, startups, all these sort of siloed widgets or technologies. I think it's not going to be about any one innovation, but again, how we pull those together to achieve our future. And we all need to appreciate that a lot of these technologies are moving very quickly. You know, Moore's Law, this is my antique iPhone 2. You know, 10 years ago it was amazing, now it feels antique. They're moving faster and faster uh, to the point where now quantum computing is coming on board, which might shift many ways of which we, how we leverage data to how we uh, do designer drugs. Some things, including quantum computing, can be overhyped. Many technologies in the earlier stages aren't great. I was in Dubai airport and saw my first autonomous auto-filing suitcase. It appeared a little bit drunk. Uh, here it is bumping into something. So just because Gen 1 of a technology isn't quite magically or there yet, uh, doesn't mean your imagination should let you see another one or two clicks of Moore's Law. So um, as we enter this exponential age, you know, realize that the desktop we used a 10, 10 years ago, now if it's on our Apple Watches, our, our smart watches are becoming FDA-approved diagnostic devices. Uh, they're all becoming connected now on 5G through the Internet of Things, trillions of devices creating, you know, massive data sets. None of us as patients, physicians, caregivers want more data. We want to turn that into information that becomes actionable at the point of care, moving what's taken 17 years to maybe 10 years to something that becomes instantaneous. We can leverage the power of the crowd to take data to knowledge and, again, to democratize that. So I challenge all of you to not, not uh, underestimate the power of some of these elements and, uh, and, and ride that exponential way going, going forward. I've been lucky to uh, have founded Exponential Medicine at a Singularity University. We've done this for you now seven, eight years. And part of the magic of convergence is bringing people from all sorts of mindsets. We have 44 countries there, folks from every kind of clinical realm and technology, um, and sort of like Startup Health, uh, help catalyze new thinking or also get out of the way of old thinking. This is one of the quotes shared by the head of NHS Innovation. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in, in escaping from the old ones. And many of our uh, traditional healthcare systems uh, and beyond are still stuck in the old, old ways. So some of you hopefully can join us uh, next year. A lot of friends and family uh, from the X-Med world are here, including Shauna Butler, my right hand, uh, for that. So as we think about technology, of course, it's not just about technology. It's how we change the incentives. Uh, instead of the sick care model rewarding health and prevention, it's how we, um, again, align what's often very misaligned. So let's look quickly at some of these moonshots and where technology is taking us and where we are even today. Access to care. Tremendous opportunities to democratize health care around the planet. You know, almost anybody can wear now almost, you know, a $20 version of a Fitbit. Fitbit only launched 10, 11 years ago. Now we can measure almost every element of behavior and physiology. We can now access care through our smartphones, which are getting uh, more and more powerful and blending into AR and VR and XR. Uh, in fact, you know, we can now be collecting data seamlessly in the era of sort of ambient computing. Your, your camera can pick up your kid's vital signs or your smartphone can calculate your heart rate and your blood pressure just from the, the camera itself. So new ways to bring access to information and diagnostics anywhere you might be. Aging in place, another big issue, uh, is being enabled by uh, tracking folks, whether they're upright, whether they're drinking, uh, what are their behaviors. 
Um, and we've gone from wearables even to underwearables. You know, several new companies like Spire and, and Skin from Giant are, um, from Mayant are now literally labeling you to have 24 seven uh, sensing in your undergarments. So, and what's interesting is now the incentives are being aligned. Uh, some of the new reimbursement codes for remote patient monitoring are paying for using these devices out in the world. So technology incentives blending. So bottom line, we're moving now in this age of 2020 from the quantified selfers of which many of us are where we can track our sleep and our steps and sort of usually stuck on our smartphones and moving that to quantified health where it flows to your clinician, your healthcare system, your AI uh, doctor in the cloud. And we can use that to optimize uh, our health and wellness, to do early diagnosis. And then when you have a disease, whether it's from cancer to hypertension, to manage it in a much more feedback looped uh, and individualized manner. And again, something as common as hypertension is going to become transformed from the ability to do that seamlessly without, uh, without cuffs. Um, we're going to be using our Wi-Fi in our homes to monitor our sleep and our behaviors. Definitely privacy challenges, but new ways, again, to be collecting things, our digitome, you know, 24-7 in really interesting ways. And then accessing the clinician. Increasingly, in the world of, you know, cheap AR, VR headsets, we'll be having what feels like real clinical interactions with caregivers, some real, some avatars, uh, that can, again, democratize access. The challenge with all this, again, is the big data problem. How do we take this and integrate that to something that's useful? I mean, what does a, a patient, a doctor, a nurse, a physical therapist to do with all these exponential data sets? We need to sort of uh, connect the dots. And our hope is that AI, I like to call it IA, intelligence augmentation, is going to start to do that, to synthesize that. So each of us and our patients has a bit of a digital twin where you can model and predict and, 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 and bring the most truly personalized and precise uh, prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. So blending sort of the machine intelligence side, the clinical side, to this whole new world of, of true anywhere, anytime, and almost free medical intelligence. And that's already here. I just ran into the founder of, of Zebra. They're already implementing AI into uh, radiology systems around the world, not to always replace the radiologist, but to combine them together. We heard from the, uh, the VP of, of, of Google. Uh, this is now rolling out in very, very powerful ways. Or to enable a colonoscopy uh, to not miss the, uh, the lesion that might have been missed, blending the, the power of the actual GI doc with AI to, to find the neoplastic lesions that might have been missed or to democratize diagnostics anywhere in the world, the, the Google DeepMind work for, for diagnosing eye disease and doing predictive medicine. And these tools, something as simple as a $2,000 ultrasound, can now upskill each of us to be an ultrasonographer and bring the ability to do uh, diagnostics pretty much anywhere in the world so that community health workers, which are really the front line in many countries, uh, can be upskilled to have the diagnostic and even therapeutic abilities that many clinicians have in the developed world. And when they do need to deliver something, it's increasingly coming by the air from drones. That was a magical idea 10 years ago. Now it's literally reality. I think 1,000 clinics in Rwanda are already connected. So the future is going to be much more connected real time, anytime, anywhere, from the virtual side to the delivery side. Now, of course, it's already overwhelming. There's 10,000 plus health and medical apps. There's dozens of wearables and other health and digital health platforms. So I'm always asked, what should I use for my patients or for myself? So very recently, I've done a very alpha launch of a new website, digital.health, that's the domain, digital.health, trying to be a bit of a digital health formulary. So if you're a clinician, you can find the tools to prescribe to a patient who might have AFib or hypertension uh, or wants an app for smoking cessation or to manage their cardiac disease. So a bit of a home for that, looking for help to help build that as a, as a community and a place for all things uh, in digital uh, health and medicine. What about lowering the costs, right? A lot of our cost to zero moonshots uh, are still thinking about healthcare in the four walls of the hospital or the clinic. Well, now increasingly, if we think about moving the needle from our sick care side to the proactive side, we can hopefully save a lot of money and suffering and not just think about proactive health, but wellness and precision wellness, optimizing uh, health span uh, and taking what used to be expensive tests, taking your urine to the lab, doing the urinalysis and Leveraging that on almost any smartphone, like Healthy IO is doing. So your, your smartphone selfie to take a picture of a skin lesion or your UA and send that directly, sometimes bypassing the physician or the pharmacist uh, to enable uh, a quick treatment of a UTI or screening for proteinuria in diabetic patients. So increasingly, in terms of lowering costs, we're seeing this advent of the hospital at home. Recent studies have shown that can often give you better outcomes at significantly lower costs. Uh, so maybe not cost zero, but costs you know, 10 or 20% with maybe 50% better outcomes. Part of our getting to cost zero is to better risk stratify our, each of us and our patients. We're in the age of you know, genomics. We've gone from a million dollar genome to basically a $200 genome today. And now it's not just doing SNPs and predicting one disease or another, but looking at polygenic risk scores to really take each of us and our patients and risk stratify them and not treat them all as one size fits all for screening. 
Uh, we do need to do a better job of uh, diversifying our databases, but I think we can start to really integrate omics of many forms, genome, microbiome, et cetera, into the workflow of clinicians and, and individuals themselves to empower them to own that information and do something with it. What about the age of the exponential cure? I mean, that's our target, moonshot or beyond to cure many diseases. Uh, we're really only less than a decade into the era of CRISPR, as one example. I think you're almost, everyone's aware of CRISPR. It's like seven, eight years ago that was invented. Now it's really entering the clinic in powerful ways to, in some cases, appear to cure uh, simple, relatively simple uh, genetic diseases like sickle cell or thalassemia that have now showed promise in literally curing a whole first batch of sickle cell patients, taking out their bone marrow stem cells, uh, fixing the genetic anomaly, either uh, uh, turning on or off genes, and uh, in, it seems in the early stages, curing in a very exciting way. Taking that a step further, we might want to address the organ shortage to cure folks with, uh, with organ failure. I think we're a ways out from 3D printing organs. We may not uh, even really need to do that. It seems sexy to 3D print cells. And there's some applications, including for drug discovery. I think with technologies like CRISPR, we're going to leapfrog that. We're starting to uh, CRISPRize and humanize pigs to knock out some of the pig genes, knock in some human genes. Um, so if you're on organ transplant list, it might not be kosher, but you'll take that organ uh, if you're on the list uh, from a human pig. So watch that space. That's sort of a blending that's going to end up with, with essentially cures for some folks who would never have gotten organs uh, otherwise. And part of the cure element is doing a better job with our data. How do we reinvent clinical trials, which is really starting to happen with the advent of platforms like HealthKit. And now that we can start to think about the virtualized clinical trial, leveraging data, leveraging modeling, and bringing traditional trials not in the four walls of the uh, ivory tower, but to almost anywhere, and also to identify the patients who might really match uh, these trials as well. And as we start to sort of collect this data in interesting ways, we're going to learn what does our digital phenotype look like in the real world. Uh, Google is doing the baseline trial. Uh, 10,000 or more individuals sharing their digital exhaust and their omics. The NIH is doing the All of Us trial, a million Americans, and like a Framingham on steroids to, to share their data. I've, I've signed up, given blood, my labs, my medical records, and there's going to be a real power in pulling that together. Eventually, when I log into my EMR, I'm going to have the collective data and knowledge of clinicians and studies from around the world instantaneously. So we're in the early ages of pulling this together. If we can all think of ourselves as data donors, reinvent some of the elements of HIPAA that might be a, a hindrance, uh, move that forward. So I think part of the vision is to reshape our thinking just like we all couldn't imagine today driving without Google Maps or Waze to build a true crowdsourced Google Maps or Waze of healthcare. We're all hopefully donating our clinical data in safe, safe and anonymized ways to build that map of healthcare, whether for your health and wellness journey or to, to manage a complex patient or population as well. What about cancer moonshots? Uh, we were lucky to have Vice President Biden here a couple of years ago. I was lucky to be at the Cancer Moonshot Summit a few years ago as well. I mean, a lot of it, uh, you know, there's a constellation of cancers out there. Uh, I know as an oncologist, I'm a pediatric oncologist, if we can pick up disease early rather than late, it makes a big difference. Uh, I and several others have been working on a new XPRIZE, a cancer uh, uh, early detection XPRIZE. And while there are companies like Grail and others certainly in that mix, what if we could get to the point where literally we could make screening for cancer as easy and cheap and fast as a urine dipstick for uh, pregnancy? So we're incentivizing hopefully a new way to do uh, global cancer screening uh, moving forward. That will hopefully move the needle uh, in, in, in cancer and beyond. Three other moonshots that kind of overlap to some degree, women's health, children's health, nutrition. Those are often fundamentally based in one of the core areas, of course, social determinants that we're better appreciating today as a core element of health, good access to food, water, education. Um, paying attention to our, you know, Maslow's hierarchy for our kids when they're young can make the fundamentals for a long, healthy life. So we have new, of course, uh, un, uh, you know, fundamentals to our, our core now, of course, especially battery life, if someone can figure that one out. Um, but on the serious sense, if we can leverage some of these social determinants, including in the food realm, we can start to maybe address the global challenge of obesity. Putting on my pediatrician hat, if we take kids at six months of age and start to give them whole grain uh, food instead of the usual white rice, cheaper uh, options, that changes their microbiome, their epigenetics, and the risk for diabetes and obesity go down dramatically. And speaking of food, we can start to measure our food, quantify calories, peanuts, etc. cetera, we measure input and measure output, right? Um, and entering this era of the sort of personalized nutritionist based on your individualized data uh, and to optimize it over time to really use, you know, food as medicine uh, in its most opportune way. 
Uh, on the, on the uh, maternal side, a lot of new sort of femtech, able to track the health of the mother uh, in utero uh, pregnancies and when the child is born to help track their health in more uh, smart ways. What about brain and mental health? Uh, clearly that impacts almost every uh, disease state. There's a lot of new tools to pick up the fingerprints of, of mental health and to optimize and nudge us in smart directions. But one of the big challenges in Moonshots is the scourge of, let's say, Alzheimer's. There's now a whole new set of technologies that can predict who's likely to get dementia 10 or even 20 years later, uh, whether it's eye tracking on your tablet or brain scans. So I think we'll enter an era where just like a statin is used to uh, prevent cardiovascular disease, we'll be giving um, better preventative measures 10 or 20 years before symptoms ever occur uh, to treat it st stage zero. If I have my own brain scanned, the ability to get imaging and leverage that information uh, is going to get increasingly more powerful. You might go to your corner uh, Walgreens or CVS and have your whole body scan done uh, for a few dollars uh, in a few minutes. Uh, there are scanners that are getting exponentially smaller and can be pushed around. Uh, not that we need to scan everybody, but these, these technologies will certainly shift how we do things and where we do things in the next decade. And speaking of mental health, a big challenge is for uh, caregivers, we've talked a bit over the last couple of days here about uh, physician burnout, epic fail, all the challenges we're seeing now. New solutions with, with voice, being able to recognize and even write your notes for you in the clinic space will help ad address that going forward. Let's finish up with longevity. We all, we live, we're here in San Francisco, a lot of people in this area want to live forever. Forever is a very, very long time. I think we want to optimize not just the number of years. I mean, no one wants to be 120 and necessarily feel 120, but think about health span and leverage a whole new set of technologies in that regard. Um, some of that may be being smartly personalized and preventative. Um, there's some nice studies using a poly pill to reduce risk of heart attack and stroke in folks who are at genetic risk, taking a single pill with multiple meds to reduce risk. Um, though we do have an issue with polypharmacy, we're still giving piles of pills to patients. How do we kind of address longevity, health, and therapy in new, new ways using some of these technologies? Well, what if we were using our pharmacogenomics, our connected health and sensors to pick the right drugs and doses for something as common as hypertension, the number one leading cause of early death and morbidity, and instead of taking, you know, a pile of pills and trying to track it in this cutting edge technology, you could sort of print your own personalized pill. So the idea of an era of your own Daniel pill with my dose of preventative meds or longevity meds or my hypertension meds if I needed them in a single tablet. So leveraging all uh, the idea of sort of 3D printing and personalization uh, in a sort of a, a point of care as you need it adaptive uh, manner. So I'm building out a platform to do that. Here's sort of the prototype version of a printer that might start in your corner pharmacy, but eventually move to your uh, kitchen sink or kitchen counter or bathroom counter and be able to look at your data. Here's the prototype. Um, look at your data, measure and print a new pill each day to optimize again prevention or if you have a complex disease to make it much easier to take your meds and be precise. Uh, you can watch my last TED talk on the details. All right. so. Lots of moonshots, lots of opportunity. The challenge is uh, um, uh, how to take good shots on goal and to do that in a collaborative way, uh, to leverage the technologies that are, are here and the ones that are coming. And again, it's usually not any one technology, but it's how we overlap them and how we hopefully appreciate that, uh, you know, 2020 is here, it's pretty incredible, but we want to be like Wayne Gretzky and skate to where the puck is going to be, to solve technologies for 2030 uh, using what's going to be possible in AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, genomics. Uh, and beyond. So our opportunity for all of us in, in achieving the future of health is to move from our reactive sick care model to one that's proactive, preventative, uh, personalized, from the one-size-fits-all realm to uh, personalized and maybe even printed, from our siloed and misaligned incentive world to one that's intelligence, crowdsourced, and uh, forward-thinking. And when we even change the mindset of each of us not to be waiting to go to the doctor or healthcare system after we're sick, but to empower each of us to be sort of the CEO of our own health. So it's an exciting time. If we want to, again, get back to the moon, uh, we can't take linear steps. We need to take exponential ones. The technology, in many cases, is already here. We just need to connect the dots. And I think there's uh, nothing more powerful than this incredible startup health uh, community uh, to not be predicting the future, but going forth and creating it. So with that, thanks, and go create the future. Cheers.